We always start our day by saying this together. Are you ready? ready. Let's go. This is the day that God has made for me. I will be thankful and enjoy it. And that is the official Pastor Mike paraphrase of Psalm 118.24. So, of course, we all know that today is a special day. It's the day where we take opportunity to celebrate a person who is very important to each of our lives and to our society as a whole. I know that not everyone had a perfect or maybe even a healthy relationship with this particular person, but we have to acknowledge that this person is the way that we made it into this world. So today, I want to wish you... Oh, come on, I'm pushing the button. <laughs> Happy birthday, person's day. <laughs> now, I must say, Bethel, shame on you. When we invited all the birthing people up, only women came. <laughs> now, if you've known me for a while, you know how extremely important it is to me to make sure that my opinions and my statements line up with the current wisdom of our society, no matter how stupid and wrong-headed it may be. It's Mother's Day. Yay. I hope we're all celebrating the mothers that we have or had or the ladies who filled in that role for us if there was a need. Now the funny thing is, I've been around here for a while and I've built up a pretty good library of sermons over the last 30 years that I've been preaching here at Bethel. And I thought, eh, I wonder what I've talked about on Mother's Day before. And I started going through my computer and looking at my notes, and I found out that I had no Mother's Day notes. I don't think I've ever spoken on Mother's Day before. So this is a new one. Be nice to me. I'm not used to this. <laughs> now, of course, I have a few thoughts on moms, mine, and all the others that I know. So here goes. I want to start by looking at what the Bible tells us about parents in general. Now, this was one of my least favorite verses that I learned as a child. They made us memorize it and relearn it every year in children's church, sometimes multiple times a year, depending on how we behaved. And we all had to sit and recite it in unison and just to make sure it's stuck, I need to remind you that my children's church leaders were my grandparents. And we would read what the Apostle Paul said in Ephesians chapter 6. Children, obey your parents because you belong to the Lord, for this is the right thing to do. Honor your father and mother. This is the first commandment with a promise. If you honor your father and mother, things will go well for you and you will have a long life on the earth. We memorized that, we said it, we made little crafts that had that verse printed on it. I, I mean, it, it was something that they wanted us to understand. We're supposed to obey our parents. Now the funny thing was, I wasn't just supposed to obey my parents. I was supposed to honor them. I was supposed to treat them with the respect that their position, that their role deserved. You know, you can obey people without honoring them. If you don't think so, remember when you had a boss. You did what that jerk told you. You could obey them, but you didn't have to respect them. God always ratchets things up a level. He wants us to obey our parents when we're children, but he wants us to honor them our entire lives. 
Now, I didn't necessarily like that when I was a kid, but when I became a parent, I saw this from a completely different angle. I decided if my kids were going to honor me as a parent, I had to be an honorable person. That verse is not just speaking to children. (laughs) I don't want my children to obey me and do something wrong because I told them to. So Paul had some good advice. Now, I was supposed to behave this way, not because my parents were always right, but because I belonged to Jesus. There are certain ways that we're supposed to behave because we belong to Jesus. And if we keep that in mind, that helps us out. And then there was the benefits. If I did this, I'd have a long life and things would go well for me. So I guess it was worth it. But that always makes me wonder, why did God make parents and stuff in the first place? There are other ways the human race could have replicated. I mean, God could have made us like worms. You just find one you like and then cut it in half. God could have made us like certain bacteria. We could replicate all on our own without any outside involvement. But he didn't. He made parents. And why did he make parents? Well, I love what the prophet Malachi says in his message from God in Malachi chapter 2. In verse 15, he says this. Didn't the Lord make you one with your wife? In body and spirit, you are his. Not only what you believe, but what you do. We are his. And what does he want? Have you ever wondered that? We go to God with lists of what we want all the time. How often do we ask what God wants? What does God want? Godly children from your union. Think about all the things God could have said that he wanted. What he said was godly children. So guard your heart, remain loyal to the wife of your youth. God put parents here to give godly children that were raised to become godly people. It seems like that's our priority. God wants godly kids. And those godly kids grow up to be godly adults. And what do they have? They get married and they have godly children. That's what God wants. It's not complicated. Now, I also love the book of Proverbs. It's like this entire endless supply of bite-sized wisdom nuggets. The book of Proverbs is not necessarily a book that you're going to spend a whole lot of time studying in depth because a lot of them are just one or two sentences and they're eminently practical. And one of the things the author of Proverbs in chapter 22 says in verse 6, it says, direct your children onto the right path and when they're older, they will not leave it. Now, there's a lot of discussion about what the right path is. Everybody has a different life's path, but they all better lead to Jesus. All of us have gone different ways. Most of us have different jobs. Most of us have different family histories. We've all been on different paths. But if those paths lead to Jesus, we're on the right path. And the author of the book of Proverbs says, if you raise your children on the right path, when they're older, they won't leave it. It doesn't say that they'll be perfect. I know for a fact that my kids are not, have never been, and will never be perfect. If for no other reason, they grew up with me. (laughs) 
But this verse gives me confidence that as I raise my kids to know and follow Jesus, when they're older, they won't leave. Then I started thinking about what the Apostle Peter tells us at the beginning of his second letter. We've read this recently, but we can look at it again. In 2 Peter chapter 1, verse 3, Peter says, By his divine power, God has given us everything we need for living a godly life. The old English teacher comes out in me, look at the form of the verb, has given. It's already happened. That means that in my life, there is nothing I need in order to live a godly life. I have it all. God has already supplied it. He goes on, we've received all of this by coming to know him, the one who called us to himself by means of his marvelous glory and excellence. And because of his glory and excellence, he's given us great and precious promises. These are the promises that enable you to share his divine nature. Do you know that you can share God's divine nature? And more along the subject of what we're talking about today, your kids, your grandkids, your great-grandkids can share God's divine nature? That seems pretty inc incredible to me. And we can share God's divine nature because of the promises that he's given us about what he has supplied us and what he thinks of us and who we are. So it enables us to share his divine nature and escape the world's corruption caused by human desires. Interestingly enough, just from a cursory observation, most of the problems we deal with in our world are because some people want certain things and other people want different things. And because we don't all want the same thing, we decide that people who don't want what we want are wrong and need to be dealt with, while they're deciding that we don't want what they want, so we're wrong and need to be dealt with. And the world starts spinning out of control. In fact, if we're not getting everything we like, we'll start breaking the rules and trying to force things to happen. All it takes is getting a leak of notes about a Supreme Court case. And we've got people showing up at justices' houses and protesting. We've got people rioting in the capital of the country. We've got people rioting all over different states. Why? Well, because those people are afraid that they're not going to like what happens. Isn't that the source of all the corruption that we deal with in our country? It's God's divine nature that allows us to escape that. It's the promises that God makes to us that allow us to escape that. And it's what God has already given us that enables us to live a godly life that allows us to escape that. It is possible for you to be one of those people that is completely aware of what's going on in our world, yet not torn apart by it. Because you've escaped that corruption. You don't like it, but it's not part of you. It's interesting. I think that's pretty cool. I think that makes all the verses where we're told to have peace make a lot more sense. We can have peace in the midst of a crazy world. I think that's pretty cool. Now the question that it led me to is how can we begin to receive these amazing gifts from God? The fact that he gives them 
doesn't help us much if we don't receive them. I remember a few weeks ago, there was a 260 some million dollar lottery ticket that hadn't been claimed. You know that that ticket did the winner no good at all? If the winner did not claim that ticket? Imagine walking around going, I got a quarter billion dollar lottery ticket. It expired two months ago. But I got it. The only response is, so what? Well, I've got all these promises from God. I've never actually received one. So what? So how do we go about receiving these promises? If we're not taught what the gifts are, if we're not taught how to receive them, it might be harder for us to understand and benefit from what God did for us. We need to be taught. So let's take a quick look at a story about one of my favorite guys in the Bible. He's a young guy named Timothy. Paul called him his spiritual son, so that means to me that he was probably led to the gospel in Paul's ministry. In studying about it, you find out that Timothy was the son of a Greek father and a Jewish mother. He was a protege of the Apostle Paul and Paul's representative to the churches in Corinth and Philippi, and eventually he became the pastor of the church in Ephesus. If any of those cities found, sound familiar, it's because they're books in the New Testament. Interestingly enough, Timothy's also mentioned as being with Paul when Paul wrote several New Testament letters. 2 Corinthians, Philippians, Colossians, 1 and 2 Thessalonians, and Philemon. When Paul wrote those books of the Bible, Timothy was with him. So I guess you could say Timothy became a major player in the early life of the church. Timothy was used by God to influence literally billions of people for the last couple of millennia. Let's look at how Paul starts his second letter to Timothy. This is a cool letter, and there's so much in it. I just want to look at it quickly. In 2 Timothy 1.1, Paul always starts this way. This letter is from Paul, chosen by the will of God to be an apostle of Christ Jesus. I've been sent out to tell others about the life he has promised through faith in Christ Jesus. That's Paul's introduction to himself. I'm writing to Timothy, my dear son. May God the Father and Christ Jesus our Lord give you grace, mercy, and peace. Timothy, I thank God for you. The God I serve with a clear conscience, just as my ancestors did. Night and day, I constantly remember you in my prayers. You know that it's okay for us to pray for each other? Now, I, I've told you before, I am not one of those people that was blessed with the gift of intercession. I know folks that can pray for hours. And then they get interrupted and they feel like they've been ripped off because they've only been praying for hours. And that's not me. I pray all through the day in little prayer McNuggets. <laughs> Sometimes I use different sauce. But I finally came on a method that works for me. If I think of somebody twice in a relatively short period of time, I need to pray for them. When I start seeing people that remind me of them all over the place, I really got to pray for them. I've been driving around and I'd see somebody who's like, oh man, that guy looks like Bob. Wait, she looks like Bob. <laughs> Wait a minute. That dog looks like Bob. 
And then that's why in my lightning quick mind, I would say, maybe I need to pray for Bob. And so I've gotten where I do. You know, Father, I don't know what's going on with Bob, but you do. But he's a child of yours, and I thank you that your hand of blessing and protection is on him. And if there's anything I can do for him, let me know. And then the next time that I talk to him, I'll say, you know, I was praying for you last week. I don't know what was going on. But, and sometimes they're going, I don't know. And then I'll say, well, your life was at peace because I was praying for you. <laughs> but the Apostle Paul, let me say it this way. The Apostle Paul is spending time praying for Timothy. I think that's pretty cool. I constantly remember you in my prayers. I long to see you again, for I remember your tears as we parted, and I will be filled with joy when we're together again. Do you get the idea that Timothy is important to Paul? Do you get the idea that he's not just useful to Paul, but Paul really likes him? My guess is that everyone in here has people that we know are important, but we may not necessarily like them that much. And that's okay. We have to love the people around us. The Bible never says we have to like all of them. What do you mean by that? There are people that are very valuable. I just don't necessarily want to be around them that much. <laughs> but I'll pray for them. If they need help, I'll help them. If I've got a free evening and four hours to go do something, they're not who I'm going to think about. But that doesn't mean I love them any less. But I get the impression that Paul really likes Timothy. When they separated, it was difficult. Timothy cried. When they get back together, Paul says he will be filled with joy. Let me just give you a hint. Filled with joy doesn't say, oh, hey. Oh, hey. Filled with joy isn't the Home Depot parking lot nod. <laughs> you know, that nod can mean a lot of things. If you do the right nod with the right eyebrow, you can hire a landscape architect. <laughs> Paul says filled with joy. I picture the father of the lost son that we talked about seeing him in the distance and running to him. I get the impression that Paul really likes Timothy and he's important to Paul. Let me move my papers here. There we go. Now, how could this young guy have become such a spiritual powerhouse? Well, how do you know he was young? Because in 1 Timothy 4.12, Paul says, don't let people look down on you because you're young. Be an example in prayer, in faith. So that tells me he was young. But he was already a spiritual powerhouse. How could he have become the man that influenced so many people in his time and beyond? Well, look at what Paul tells us next, starting in verse 5. I remember your genuine faith. Genuine faith. Not a swap meet knockoff off of faith. Not the eBay version of faith. Genuine faith. Not the infomercial at 2 in the morning version of faith genuine faith. And look at this. 
For you share the faith that first filled your grandmother Lois and your mother Eunice. What faith did he share? The faith of his mother and his mother's mother. Paul says, and I know the same faith continues strong in you. Can you think of any better gift for a mother than knowing that her authentic, genuine faith had taken root in her son and remained strong? They my parents were not remotely perfect. And there are times when I might take some credit for that because I was, let's say, a challenge. (laughs) But if there was one thing I knew about my dad and I knew about my mom is that they wanted to know Jesus. And sometimes they may have gotten it wrong. But what I always thought was interesting is when they got something wrong, they would say, oh man, I got that wrong. I'm sorry. And then they'd go on to what they thought was right. Do you know people who will never ever admit that they've done something wrong? And they'll do something and they know it's not working, but they'll stick with it for years. They're going through the same motions every day and nothing changes. But they can't say they've done something wrong. That's not genuine faith. They can't say they've missed it or maybe they've gone off on a trail. Timothy has the same faith continuing strong in him that was strong in his mother and strong in her mother. Paul says, this is why I remind you to fan fan into flames the spiritual gift that God gave you when I laid my hands on you. You know that God can give you things and you can let them go cold? Whose job is it to fan those flames? God's? No. No. There are a lot of things in our lives that we don't realize it, but when we don't use them, they start to fall apart. Some of us have had cars or motorcycles that we really liked, but we just got too busy to mess with them. And they sit there and all of a sudden you realize, oh my gosh, I haven't ridden my motorcycle in a year. And then we go out and our head says, well, it ran fine when you rode it last time. And Todd, you go out in the garage and you knock some of the dust off of it and you make sure the battery's charged and you try and start it up and it sounds funny and it's smoking bad. Well, what happened? Nothing, you just weren't using it. That works in us too. Paul is encouraging Timothy to fan the flames of the spiritual gift God gave him when Paul laid his hands on him. Exercise that genuine faith that was planted in him by his mother and his grandmother. He goes on in verse 7, For God has not given us a spirit of fear and timidity, but power, love, and self-discipline. Why would Paul be talking about any of this? Because when we quit using something and it comes time to use it again, we tend to get a little intimidated. We might be a little scared. I have to assume I am not the only person who has felt God lead him to do something and thought, oh, I can't do that. I can't do that. What will people think of me? What if they said no? Well, I got to assume 
that that attitude does not come from God. That attitude comes from a faith, from a gift that's been allowed to go cold. So Paul is talking to Timothy about this. Now, Timothy's mom and Timothy's grandma, the faith that they demonstrated and showed to him was a formative factor in his life. We've all had formative factors in our lives, some of them good, some of them not so good. But we've got to at least recognize that they're there. The genuine faith of Timothy's mom and grandma were formative factors in his life. Paul goes on in verse 8. So never be ashamed to tell others about our Lord. Don't be ashamed of me either, even though I'm in prison for him. Oh yeah, that's my buddy Paul. He's in prison again. What's he in prison for? preaching where they don't like him preaching right I can remember taking tours of the Riverside City Jail we would take our juniors and seniors in high school down there and take a tour and go in and sit in on a trial in court and discuss things we'd usually have a meeting with one of the city attorneys and stuff just exposing them to the legal system And one of the things that we were told was that not a single person in that jail had done anything wrong, according to them. So I can hear Timothy going, oh, yeah, I I just got a letter from my friend Paul. Oh, really? Where is he? Oh, he's in jail for preaching. Oh, right, preaching. Preaching. Paul says, don't be ashamed of me. You can tell people what's happening to me. I'm okay. He goes on, with the strength God gives you, (laughs) be ready to suffer with me for the sake of the good news. You know, strong, genuine faith really only exposes itself as strong and genuine when you're going through something. I, I, I hate to say that, but it's not till it's tested that we know. Not God, God knows everything. He doesn't have to test us. But our faith gets tested sometimes by the situations we're in. And I've been on both sides of that. Oh, I can't take this. I can't deal with this. I don't know what to do. Why isn't God helping me? And then I've been in situations where it's like, oh man, this is going to be bad. Oh, that wasn't that bad. I mean, I could see how it could have been, but no. It's only once it's tested. Be ready to suffer with me for the sake of the good news in verse 8. In verse 9, Paul says, For God saved us and called us to live a holy life. Watch this. He did this not because we deserved it. Why do we look at living a holy life as a punishment? Oh, God wants us to live a holy life. We can't do that. God's being unreasonable. According to Paul... He's called us to live a holy life, not because we deserve it, but because that was his plan from before the beginning of time, to show us his grace through Jesus Christ. Living a holy life is a reward of having a strong, genuine faith in Jesus. Maybe our definition of holy life isn't accurate. Maybe we see the holy life as most junior high students might. means you don't get to do any of the fun stuff. And you have to do all the boring stuff. 
But interestingly, that's not how the Bible portrays a holy life. Depending on what stage of life you're in right now, if you're just beginning your life, you have a little clue about some of the stuff you're going to face. If you're in the middle of the life, you've experienced a lot of stuff. If you're kind of on the downhill part and you know that the end is coming, and I don't mean soon, I just mean I know that I'm not going to live another 59 years. So I'm on the downhill side. I don't see myself being 118 and laughing at my great uncle Bob who only made it to 104. I know. But think about all that stuff we've had to go through and deal with that we rather would have not. The bad choices, the unhealthy relationships, the personal issues. A holy life involves none of those. I'm thinking maybe a holy life is a perfect life. And that's what God had planned for us before the beginning of time. And in verse 10, it says, Now he's made all of this plain to us by the appearing of Christ Jesus our Savior. He broke the power of death. He illuminated the way to life and immortality through the good news. He showed us this with Jesus. Do we read about Jesus' life in the Gospels and think about how hard it must have been? Or is that the template that God set for us? It might require a little education and changing of attitude. He broke the power of death. Friends, if we understood what that means, it would change our attitudes. Death has no power over you if you're a child of God. Well, Pastor Mike, does that mean you want to die? No. But let me say this. If for some reason something happened, I believe with everything in me that I'm fine. It's y'all that are going to be down here sad because you can't figure out how to live life without me. <laughs> I'm going to be in heaven. I was talking with our daughter Angela and she was talking about trying to explain some of the concepts of heaven to first graders because that's who she teaches. And to me, I think it's always kind of a superficial mindset, but we all like to think about what our mansion in heaven is going to look like. And I said, you know, the funny thing is, I'm not really even interested in this huge mansion. I just want a three-bedroom place with a nice TV and a 45-car garage. <laughs> but none of that's going to matter when we get to heaven. Well, they'll rotate. The storage facility will be off-site. Those are just the ones I'm going to drive this week. Perhaps... The life Jesus led is to be our idea of a perfect life. Just, just a thought. So, the faith that mothers can share and pass down to their children faith that we can tell others about, faith that gives us strength for the sake of the good news, faith to have a life blessed and full of grace in Jesus. That's the faith 
a mother can share. That's the faith Timothy's mother shared. That's the faith Timothy's grandmother shared. And you and I are reading about and benefiting from that faith today. Just for a second, try and wrap your head around somebody in a couple thousand years talking about your faith. Well, that's not going to happen. I don't think Timothy was thinking that would ever happen. Yet here we are talking about the faith of Timothy and his mom and his grandma on Mother's Day. Talk about an amazing opportunity. Sharing that faith and cultivating it in our kids and grandkids. Showing them how to share God's love, share God's grace with the people around us. We might be wondering, well, what if I didn't have a mom who did that for me? I'm just out of luck, right? No, you're not. God is a good father. He's never caught unprepared. Number one, I think most of us can look at times when people have stepped in and filled a role or a need that we had in our lives, even though they may not have been related to us. In the years that I've been working in our school systems, I have seen so many examples of people who had no biological connection to some of these kids at all, raising some of these kids because the kids needed it. Now, I don't know, Charles, have you spent any time with high schoolers in your life? <laughs> A few. A few. Yeah. Me too. They needed it. Charles was available. Charles said, here I am, what can I do? We've all got that opportunity with the people around us. Are we paying attention to see where a touch from God might help or make a difference? We can do that. You might think it's odd that I'm standing here talking about Mother's Day and my mother is not here. Some of you may think, but I saw her before church. And you did. You know where she is right now? She's at another church. Oh, sure, she's coming over to our house afterwards because we're feeding her. <laughs> My mom went to another church because the pastor of this church was having a special service to honor a handful of ladies that he sees as ladies that have stepped into the mom role with him over his life. And he wanted to have a special time to honor them. She's not related to him. He's Korean. <laughs> She's not. <laughs> she wouldn't even know where Hyundai's come from. <laughs> but she was able to be there and to step in and fill a role that was needed in this gentleman's life. And it made an impact on him. Guess what each one of us can do when the opportunity presents itself? Now, you don't go wedging yourself into someone's life. But when there's a need, if they'll let you help, you help. Oh, but I never had that example. Yes, you did. You're surrounded by that example. 
at some point in time, we got to quit feeling sorry for ourselves because we may not have gotten what we thought we wanted and start paying attention to the people around us. God has given you everything you need to live a godly life. You've got people all around you with genuine faith who have been planting it and cultivating it. And it's time to start impacting the people around us. Well, I don't like those people. That's okay. Very likely, those are not the people that you're called to deal with. There are certain kind of folks I can just walk up to, never having seen them before, and start talking. I know that because my girls roll their eyes at me. (laughs) We were at a restaurant in town once, and they walked in. I had gotten there first, and they walked in, and I heard one of them say to the other, oh, gosh, he's talking to that guy over there again. And I thought, I had to. He was wearing a motorcycle shirt. He's one of my guys. <laughs> if I walk in and you're wearing a Mustang shirt, we're family. <laughs> we may not have ever met, but we're family. You, you, you see? And all those little silly things are opportunities for us to take what's been given to us and share it with other people. Just like Timothy did. Our faith becomes more genuine when we act it out and share it with those around us. So that's my Mother's Day story. 